or doctrinally loose or liberal when compared to the people of the day in general, or even when compared to the apostles. These guys were way ahead when it came to knowledge of God and the Bible, and they were far more pious than anyone else who was there listening to Jesus that day. But Jesus says that true righteousness looks like more than what these teachers and Pharisees do. I know at this stage I'd be throwing my hat in the air and walking away because I wouldn't have a snowball's hope in hell of achieving anything even close to the required standard in my own strength. So for those who don't want me, mine is Mark. Um, and I'm just uh, going to start on here now. We're doing the second tree of the commands given by Jesus on the mountain on that morning. Now, last week, Pastor Mike shared the first of these three with a guides for holy living. And today, I'm going to continue on with the next three. And as far as the next three are concerned, I guess the main theme in all of this guidance that Jesus has given us from the mount is the importance of knowing that God sees our words and our actions. He sees inside and outside. He wants us to speak truthfully instead of falsely and act gracefully instead of being vengeful. As was stated last week in verse 20 of chapter 5, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now we all know this morning that in our own strength that's an impossible impossibility. It's unachievable. But again, as was stated last week by Pastor Mike, Jesus empowers us to live to lead lives of biblical integrity from the inside out. The principle stands for all six of Jesus' instructions. It's not based on our ability to carry out his demands. It's based on our dependence on him to help us become better people with heaven-set eyes. So Jesus told the people that day, and as he's telling us today, at six separate times, you have heard it said, which was the law, and then he goes on to say, but I tell you, which is Jesus' instruction to us. And in doing this, Jesus is illustrating to us how to live as children of God, as opposed to living as children of the world. And it's then up to us to heed his voice and to follow out his example. But as I say, not in our strength, in his strength. And in fairness to Jesus, he doesn't just throw out these commands and rules in order to bind us up today and to make us struggle with trying to be a good or a better person. The world is full of those kind of people. There's a much bigger action in play right throughout Matthew 5, from last week, right into this week, right into the end of verse 48. So bear with me as we try and break this down from 33 to 48 and see what the Lord will say to us through his word. So to put this in a modern context, for each and every one of us here today. Here at Calvary, Cork, we're going to get a rugby team together, right? Thanks be to God, we have Victor down there anyway, that he'd be a big help. <laughs> and we're going to take on the Irish national team within the next week or so. And unless we beat them, you ain't going to heaven. Ernie True, beautiful singer. But unless you can sing better than the best singer in the whole world, Ernie, you ain't getting into heaven. To the best musician, if you're not singing better than the best singer, you're not getting into heaven. Or musician, you're not getting into heaven. Golfer, Keen, go beat Tiger Woods. Well, back in the day, you see, the, I hope you're getting the idea. It's just impossible. So it's not good news at all. And can this passage really mean just that? Or is there some other meaning in these verses? I mean, surely there has to be a reasonable explanation for this section. And I think thankfully there is, because Jesus is basically calling each and every one of us here today to listen to what he says about each of the comments. He starts each one with, you have heard. And then explains it on, but I tell you. And where was it heard? It was heard in the Torah or the Old Testament. But I tell you, and this is Jesus' New Testament coming into play right before everybody's eyes on the mount that day. So you can see through these verses, or, or, or comments, or commands, 
that Jesus is calling us to the great righteousness of the heart. He's explaining to us what God is saying in these verses, the true meaning of what God has commanded and breaking it down for anyone who has misunderstood it. Because Jesus did say in verse 17 that he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. And in each of these examples today, swearing and making of oaths, revenge, treatment of enemies, there is God's external command, which is always good, always was good, always had a foundation. But underneath that command, oh God has always cared about the deeper issue of each and every one of us. And it's the, the, the issue of the inner person, your, your heart. So let's have a look at each one and let's go through them and let's see what, what we come up with. Um, verses 33 to 37. I'll just run over them again. Again, you have heard it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair black or white. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no, and anything beyond that comes from the evil one. So this refers to the sin of using oaths to affirm that what is said is true. I mean, the Pharisees used all kinds of tricks to sidestep the truth. And oaths were among those that they used. They avoided using God's holy name, but they would come close by swearing maybe on the city of Jerusalem, heaven, earth, or some part of their body. And Jesus was saying that our conversation should be so honest and our character so true that you wouldn't need crutches to get people to believe you. You see, words depend on character and oaths can never compensate for a poor character. And as Proverbs 10, 19 states, when words are many, sin is not absent but he who holds his tongue is wise. So the more words a man uses to convince us, the more suspicious we should always be because you let your yes be yes and your no be no. I mean, I, we just had an experience last week. Was we bought these couple of bottles and they're supposed to be these fantastic bottles and there's loads of uh, descriptions about them in the whole lot and um, they're they're thermal, so they keep it hot and cold, and we go through it and look at different ones. I saw myself and Lauren said, yeah, yeah, they're, they're perfect for us. We're going to buy them now. We'll, we'll get them. Um, because of the description and everything else like that. And next thing they arrive, and of course, they're nothing like what they'd be taught to were. And again, we're after getting caught. The internet is after having us. But we listened, looked at all these words, and we thought it was, wow, this is fantastic. So let's go get these bottles, and then the disappointment when you actually get them, because it's not what is said on the table. And it's typical, it's, 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 it's one of those things. Lots of words, nothing in behind it. You see, oaths are part of the greater heart issue. They're ways that we use to attempt to manipulate other people or even God, rather than looking at ourselves and determining to be truthful without fail. When Jesus spoke about oaths on the mount, he was grabbing a current problem by the nick at that time. And he was addressing not only the Jewish teachers of the law, but he was also addressing the whole congregation. Because everybody had become lax when it came to their word being their bond, especially when it came to dealing and talking honestly with other people. And when Jesus arrived on the scene, playing around with and bending the truth had become common practice. And it's even more so today. As one commentator, Charles Quarles, one points out, some first century rabbis emphasized the importance of speaking the truth to God only and downplayed the importance of absolute honesty in all communications with all men. They taught that they had a special obligation to keep promises made to God but downplayed the need for complete honesty when dealing with their fellow men because it was convenient for them. And this is despite the fact that they knew full well the Father's commands from the Old Testament with clear instructions on how important truth was. And if you go back in and read in Zechariah 8, 16 and 17, it tells us, these are the things you must do. 
Speak truth to one another. Make true and sound decisions within your city gates. Don't plot evil in your hearts against your neighbor. And do not love perjury, for I hate this. And this is the Lord's declaration. This is also really important for us to hear today as we have to stand out from the pack when it comes to speaking truth to all. I know I'm sure all of us here this morning can recall times when we've been, um, how do you say, bindy with the truth. And to be honest, it can leave an awful taste in your mouth. But much worse than that, it can also leave an awful stain in your character uh, when found out. And we always get found out. Because even if you manage to fool one another, you're never going to fool God. And you know, if you're looking for an idea of, of truth or deceit or whatever, I mean, I play a bit of golf, King plays a bit of golf, and, and we know that if there's nobody looking at you, you still have to put down the right score. So if you get a six at a hole and you put down a four, well, that's rubbish because you're cheating somebody else out of a their scores as well. And on top of that, it really goes against the grain of the, the, thought behind, the thought process behind golf because it's about honesty and integrity. And how many times have I seen down through the years where people have been caught out cheating? Maybe once, just once. And I know it from, let's say, um, uh, professionals, even to fellas in my own club. Just once they might have been caught out. And to this day, 10, 15, 20 years after, they're still known as cheats. And they might never again have cheated. They might have been honest as the day is long after that. But it makes no difference because the stain is on their character and people will always relate them to that day that they cheated. So I think it's an important example for us to, to be careful and to, to be truthful. But on the opposite side, that thing you see, there's nothing better than a true brother or sister. And over time, that person becomes one of good repute, someone to be trusted for their honesty, and integrity, and all because their word is their bond, and they let their yes be yes, and they let their no be no. And these people become sought after within our church family even, when we're looking for true, valuable advice and guidance, assistance and encouragement, or whatever else we're looking for. We, we always go to the person that's known for their, their truth and their integrity. Jesus is calling each and every one of us here this morning to be that person in verse 20, whose righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because that person is honest and truthful, where it can be seen on the outside by everybody else and everybody who knows them, but also on the inside, which is the heart where God sees it. And just one more thing um, in relation to oaths before we move on, is that when I make an oath or a promise, I'm given a personal guarantee and promising that I will do this or I will go there or I will be this or that. It's as if I'm in complete control when I'm not actually in control at all. It's only God as sovereign. The future's in his hands. So all I can do is to make a promise to do my best to be there. If God is willing, or as we say in this fair land, I will with the help of God. And to close the section, I'd just like to look at Proverbs 12, 22, where it tells us, the Lord detests lying lips, but he's delight in people, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. I don't know about you, but I really want to be that person that the Lord of all creation delights in. And as we've been reminded last week and again this week, it is Jesus empowers us to live lives of biblical integrity from the inside out. So as we move on into retaliation and the eye for the eye, and the tooth for the tooth, this is a love, nice one, it gets better. So you have heard that it was said, no, wrong one. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. If someone forces you to go a mile, Go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So again, this law dates back to around 1750 BC and it was first recorded in a document called the Code of Hammurabi. I'm looking to be able to pronounce it. Google is brilliant. It works wonders when you're looking for information. 
You can also find this law in the Torah, and basically what it's saying is where there's conflict, justice demands the following, as God points out in Exodus 21, 23 to 25. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, born for born, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Now this sounds fairly brutal by today's standards whereby in a court of law, either a person might get a prison term or community service, pay compensation, something like that. It could be the way forward if there was any bit of an aspect of remorse at all for what's after happening. But it's very important to remember that these guides were written when there was no just and civil laws in a just and civil society. People lived in tribes, and if one person did wrong to another person, well, then there was going to be retribution and retaliation. So you hit me, and then I hit you back, and maybe I'll just get my friend uh, to help me and to join in too. And on and on and on it goes, until eventually whole communities or tribes would end up at war with one another, with multiple deaths, all because some lad got a black eye. And it could just keep escalating without end, as we've seen even in modern society, we see it all the time. But this law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was designed to curb the violence, not encourage it. Because once the matter was judged that the victim was wronged and was entitled to do to the culprit the same deed that was done to him, no more and no less. Well, then this law made a lot of sense for the people of Israel because while it didn't prevent hostility, it did keep it in check and it prevented aggrieved victims from taking personal revenge. But now Jesus is going to step in here and he's going to make some really bold comments in relation to it. And for whoever hadn't slinked down the mountain quietly after the first four declarations, I reckon they're definitely getting closer to doing that after this one. Because here Jesus is replacing the law with an attitude. And he's basically saying, be willing to suffer loss yourself rather than cause another to suffer loss. Jesus was applying this to the individual situation and not to groups or nations because Jesus wants to get at the heart of the individual and challenge each individual's way of thinking. The person who retaliates only makes himself and the offender feel worse and the result is basically a settled war rather than a lasting peace. But in order to turn the other cheek, you have to stay where you are, you can't run away. And this demands both faith and love. What will it mean? Well, firstly, it means you're going to be hurt. But Jesus is telling you, it's better to be hurt on the outside than harmed on the inside. And this section is also telling us that we should always try, if possible, to help the offender. So does this mean that if I hear someone breaking into my house, I should go to the door and open it for them just to make it easier? No, not at all. That would be fairly foolish. When trouble comes your way, you have every right to protect your family, your property, so on. There are always going to be times when you have to resist those that want to harm you. But Jesus himself resisted when the leaders in Nazareth dragged him out of the synagogue and tried to throw him over the cliff. So defending yourself against a violent attack is one thing, but what Jesus is getting at here basically is that if someone strikes you on the cheek with a slander or a bad mouth, um, or if they're bad mode about you, or, or try to drag your reputation through the dirt. Well, just brush it off and walk away. Let the Lord judge on your behalf, because as Paul told us in Romans 12, 19, he said, don't seek revenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to God's wrath. For this is written, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. So basically, don't seek revenge yourself. You can feel vulnerable as a result because the attacker may attack again. But we are also victorious because you're on the side of Jesus and he's helping and building your character all the way along. Psychologists have for a long time now told us that violence is born from weakness, not strength. It's the strong man that can love and suffer hurt. It's the weak man who thinks only of himself and hurts others in order to protect himself. Hurt and run, hurt and run. It's always the same formula and nothing ever changes except for the, the face of the victim. 
and through violence, mockery, whatever other means at their disposal, on they go. But always remember this, that person who's doing that is absolutely miserable on the inside and will never be satisfied. I mean, in the 30 years of doing my job as a Garda, I've seen this time and time again with people. And I've seen the bitterness and the hatred and the anger that comes through them every time. And occasionally you get a glimpse of the other side. And you can see the huge victory that comes with forgiveness. And I suppose one of the biggest cases that, that, that I've seen it through would have to be uh, friends of ours now, Anthony and Colette Wolf. I mean, their child had bullies that caused their daughter's uh, uh, suicide at 18 years of age. And I've watched their journey from certain destruction onto new life through forgiveness. I remember a time when they were getting lads together to get into a car to go after the bullies. And Colette might have rang me to look for my advice and guidance and help or whatever else and so on and so forth. And I, over time, that receded and it went from a need for revenge to forgiveness. And over time, as they started to trust and lean on Jesus that little bit more, their need for retribution was diminished, it was gone, and it became of no importance at all. And you could see the tenderness coming into them. You, you, you could see how all they wanted was, how, how am I going to survive this? How are we going to get through this darkness? And I saw in that picture, the bigger Jesus became in their lives, the more they held on to him. And you could see that their hearts were changing from darkness to light. And as it did so, their only need was to know Jesus. And they wanted to know more because they could see how having a relationship with Jesus was helping them to survive even on the darkest days. And it was a ferocious re revelation to me to see how just, just how far Jesus is willing to go in order to secure the souls of those he loves. And now see, Jesus saw their hearts and he was going to see him through this. And nothing, the worst disaster in the whole world, which came against them, was not going to stop. The pit of hell was not going to come against them. And now you're looking at them 12, 13, 15 years down the road, and what did they do? In and out of houses, bringing the same message of hope to people who've lost loved ones through suicide. Up and down the country, into schools, here, there, everywhere they go. That's, that's their, they do it full time. And they're getting calls from all over the country to go, even into Catholic schools and things like that, there's no problem. They just want them to come in and share um, their message of hope through all of this. And let me tell you, only God could do this. Only God could do it. And I've seen so many cases, I know for a fact, only God could do, create a situation like this. And thanks be to God that he does it. So it can be a real test of a person's character to turn the other cheek and show forgiveness. And we can sometimes feel there's an awful lot being asked of us. And how the heck am I supposed to act in such a forgiving manner? Well, folks, you've got a great example for anyone here this morning who considers themselves to be a Christian. And that example is God himself. And he loved us while we were still his enemy. And he sent his only son, his perfect, holy, pure son to suffer a cruel death that was due to us so that we could be reconciled with him. Now that's perfect love. And at the age old verse, you all know it. Well, if you're reading the Bible and building to time, you probably do. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And C.S. Lewis once said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. So as we move on with love for enemies, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may, may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, 
as your heavenly Father is perfect. Excuse me. Nowhere did the law teach hatred for one's enemies, Old or New Testament. Passages like Exodus 23, 4 and 5 indicate just the opposite, where it says, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. If you see the, the donkey of someone who hates you falling down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help it up. You see, Jesus defined our enemies as those who curse us, those who hate us, those who exploit us selfishly. And since Christian love is an act of the will and not simply an emotion, he has the right to command us to love our enemies. After all, as I've already stated, he loved us while we were still his enemies. And Romans 5.10 tells us, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And we can show this love by blessing those who curse us, doing good towards those who don't want us, and praying for them. And when you pray for an enemy, it feels an awful lot easier to think positively towards them. And you know what? Prayer will always take the poison out of your attitude. And Jesus gives several reasons for this admonition. He said, the love is, is a mark of a maturity. It's proven that you're children of the, the Most High Father, not just little children. It's, it's God-like. The Father shares his good things with those who oppose him. As we saw already in Matthew 5, 45, it shows that our love creates a climate of blessing that makes it easy to win over your enemy and make them your friend. And love is like the sunshine and the rain that the Father sends on everyone so graciously. And it's a testimony to others what do you do more than others is a good question. God expects us to live on a much higher plane than the lost people of the world who return good for good and evil for evil. And as Christians, we have to return good for evil because that's an investment of love. And the word perfect in Matthew 5.40, it doesn't simply, doesn't imply sinlessly perfect, for that's impossible. It suggests completeness and maturity as children of God. The Father loves his enemies and seeks to make them his children. And we need to assist him. Our enemies will get what's coming to them at the right time. We need to learn how to shut our mouths and remove the anger from our hearts. It's, it's time for each and every one of us to start walking the path of righteousness and the world is getting darker every day. And to get back to letting God fight our battles. Something I read while preparing for this message this morning was don't ever forget who you are but more importantly don't ever forget whose you are and when someone messes with you they're messing with your God and Corrie ten Boom then says you never touch the ocean of God's love as when you forgive and love your enemies so to finish off this morning folks I suppose it's fair to say that we all have trouble being completely honest and looking inside our hearts and coming face to face with our motives. I mean, do you find it a real challenge to face the chaos that's going on inside there? Because I know I sometimes do. I regularly do. Um, the big problem for me is that I know that God sees the inside of me and that's where he wants to really get to work. It's really much easier to do the outside work and get involved in all kinds of things externally and, and live a good outward Christian life and give that fantastic external picture of peace and happiness and basically play the game. But I know when we look into our, our own hearts, there's a lot of stuff in there that are, that they're, and, and we really are not proud of it and we need some repair work done but don't really want to get it sorted because it's too difficult. I mean, there might be shame, hurt, pain in there. And you know what? It really can be so much easier just to keep everyone, including God, at arm's length and keep that stuff buried. But when Jesus made these declarations on the Mount, he already knew that. And yet he called us all who would follow him to reach to a new standard, a standard that would be impossible to achieve through your own efforts. But he was what was more than possible if we would take that step and trust him to help us with these heart issues. 
And when you look at the six examples of, of righteousness, it's easy to see that each and every one of us here today, whether Christian or not, we're all broken, without exception. Our lives are scarred from our past and from what's happening recently. We're scarred with anger, with jealousy, with lust, self-serving, backbiting, retaliation, hatred, and that's not even the start of the list. And you know what? Sometimes you look at all these heart issues and you just throw your hands up and say, not a hope. It's too hard to try and sort this out. And you're right, it is. In your own strength, impossible. I mean, didn't the Pharisees and the teachers of the law do just that? They walked away and they decided, look, it's a lot easier to hate this man, Jesus, because the alternative called for too much sacrifice on their part and too much omission and admission of guilt. And the problem with walking away is that the work isn't finished. There's no wholeness of life in it. There's no perfection through the blood of the Lamb. It's an unfinished work and it's of no use. But here's some great news this morning, and I really hope it encourages you. God sees and cares about each and every single heart inside her. So much so that he was happy to send his beloved, perfect son to a cruel and vicious death at the hands of very angry sinners, even though he knew exactly what, they were, what we were like, what we were like. He knew everything there is to know about us, inside and out, and yet, he was delighted, not just willing, he was delighted to sacrifice Christ on our behalf. Because Jesus knew when he spoke on the mountain that day, and he also knew we could never obey. Jesus knew this when he spoke on the mountain that day, and he also knew that we could never obey these directions in our own strength. But he wasn't trying to shame us or belittle us when he spoke these words. Jesus knew that if we have the same desires for righteousness that God has for us, it will happen. Not in our strength, but through our dependence on him, on our desire to be Christ-like, to be God-fearing people who bring joy to our Father and believe on his promise given in Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I'm going to be, I will be their God and they will be my people. So this week it might be a good idea for each and every one of us. I speak to myself first and you as well. To start keeping a check on our emotions, our thoughts, our reactions. And maybe start examining ourselves and using the time to ask ourselves, well, look, what does God want me to learn from this passage or these things about myself? I mean, is there a feeling of discomfort as you've gone through these past two Sundays and listened to Jesus' commands from the mount? Are you feeling a bit sort of chewed up and spat out because they're hard commands to keep? And if that's you this morning, well, then that's really good because, first of all, it means you were listening. That's important. And secondly, and more importantly, it probably also means that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit has given you a bit of a nudge and he's calling you to become a more wholehearted person, and he wants the very best for your life so that you can live according to your true calling, being the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ in the county of Cork, in the city of Cork, and way beyond, where no plot from the pit of hell will ever hold you back because your heart is one with Christ your Saviour. And so I encourage you this morning through the words of our brother Caleb Lane, where he once wrote, so don't be afraid to fall at his feet because it's at the cross where Christ and sinners meet and it's in him we are complete. Let him complete you in your heart today. Let him touch you and renew your heart and bring you back to where you belong. We're going to worship soon now and we're going to break bread. We're going to drink some juice in remembrance of all that he has sacrificed for you and me. Our prayer team are down the back and they're only here to help you. And they're only waiting to pray with you. We want absolutely nothing from anyone here today except to see you at your very best through the strength of Christ. And my hope is that you'll use the time wisely to strengthen your faith. If you need to pray with someone from the team, do it and don't hold back. Only God knows what tomorrow brings. And it might be too late tomorrow. Now is the time for renewal and encouragement. And if you're a first time here, or if you're a non-believer, a non-Christian, 
Don't go without saying hello. It's supposed to be love to meet you. We're not going to pressurize you into anything. But the salvation game is serious. It's important. You get one life. You get one chance. And we'd hate to see you walk away without making the most of it. May God bless you, encourage you, and strengthen you this week. Let's pray. Father God, I give you thanks for this morning. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord God, that it will be a blessing to us. I pray that we would learn from it, that we would each examine ourselves, that we would go away and have a think about it, and endeavour to do better, Father God, or endeavour to become more Christ-like. And we can only do that with your help, Father God, because we've tried all this before and it doesn't work for us. So we ask you for help. And we ask you for blessing and for protection for us and our loved ones. And I pray that you bring each and every one of us to a new level, deeper in Christ and more in line and in tune and love with one another inside here. Bless this house, Father God. Bless the people in it. Be with us all in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.